you want with it. As long as you sort of, you know, keep qualifying each week, you still get the money. Mm. It's dependable. Um, and so we're seeing some focus on sort of uh, that universal basic income, or sometimes it's called um, like universal income or like basic right. income. Basic income, yeah. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't like it's interesting. All of these individual places put forward what they call a UBI, but if it's if it's not everywhere, then it's not universal. Right. <laughs> it's and, right. it, and 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 it's often not even basic because sometimes it just amounts to uh, a few hundred dollars, which is which is much needed, but but much more is is needed than that. You've done a lot of looking at this information. You've you've done a lot of gathering of of information around this what is most helpful to people in term one in terms of what would be the ideal comprehensive solution and then on the other hand what is what is the most likely most possible thing that we have given the system as it exists currently right so you know the First and foremost, biggest, best solution is that we should get rid of this 1099 status. This is really just a way for these companies to save themselves money. You know, not that long ago, people found out that Walmart and like McDonald's were counseling their employees to apply for food stamps, like walking them through how to do it. And people, there was outrage. But you know what? Uber is doing that. Except they're doing it even more because instead of it being food stamps, which you could argue kind of like help out the farm producers, they're just saying, hey, we're just not going to cover any taxes for you. And we're going to have you, you know, take on all these expenses and then you're going to struggle and it's fine. So that's what we need to do. We need to, number one, get rid of this 1099 status. It is most often simply being used by corporations to save themselves money. Yeah. And but then the set. Uh, uh, I, it, I just want to like chip in here. First of all, I think they, <laughs> they tried to do it in, in California and, and, and failed. I want to get into like what happened around that and, and why it failed. And second of all, I just, it's amazing to think about like the way that that's structured, because if anybody came to you and said, um, I'm good. I'm just going to like structure my pay in terms of, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just not going to like pay taxes and I'm going to structure things <laughs> uh, around that. You would say, well, that's not right. That should be illegal. And yet, like somehow in, in this instance, it's not. And furthermore, like the, the amounts of money that you make, even though as they exist, they're, they're completely inadequate and, and way, way too low and way too like precarious, the sources that they, they come from. They're even lower than that because the, the standards that we have in our mind are for W-2 work, which have all those things in place and have all those benefits and supports in place. And, 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 and so like really it's, it's higher than that. It's like the, the amount of benefit that you get from, from a W-2 job, whereas it, like the paltry amount that you get in most cases from the gig economy is even more paltry because you have to pay for all of those things that yourself. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think everybody who has a W-2 office job has spent time sitting there playing solitaire or maybe you're on Insta or yeah. maybe you're reading the newspaper. What You're on Twitter. You're doing something. Sure. But if you're a gig worker, that time when you're not actively driving, actively doing a task, that is unpaid time. And so it's not unusual for gig workers to be sitting there for maybe 45 minutes just waiting for a ping. And you're waiting you're waiting outside the location where you're thinking you're going to get a ping. There was one woman I interviewed. She was a physical therapist. She was doing Instacart and she had to sit outside the grocery store, but she couldn't leave the grocery store because if she left the grocery store, she wouldn't get the pings. She ended up going to the bathroom in like a garbage bag that she kept in her car because she couldn't leave her car to go to a bathroom. And it was COVID times in the grocery store. Yeah. bathroom was closed to her like yeah. this is <laughs> and because there are no regulations around an actual workplace because you're quote unquote an independent contractor none of those like the the health difficulties arising from that are going to be addressed in any way 
No, absolutely right. not. And, you know, these independent contractors, there are health problems that come with this, right? We've yeah. known for years about taxi cab bladder, right? Yeah. Taxi cab drivers have a really hard, they end up having bl bladder and kidney problems later on because they've had to hold their pee for so long. Yeah. Well, the same thing is going to be happening to this whole generation of gig workers. Yeah. You know, it's... <sighs> Dig in a little bit to to what happened in California because they were trying to make, as I understand it, and correct correct me if I don't have it exactly correct. They were trying to make, um, you know, Uber and Lyft drivers and other gig economy uh, workers uh, into uh, actual employees as opposed to independent contractors. What, what were they What were they trying to do, and why did it Why did it fail, especially in California? Right. So this was AB5. And the idea was that California was recognizing that lots of companies were trying to save money by making their workers independent contractors instead of employees. And that, you know, outsources all this risk to the workers. Mm -hmm. But the funny thing that's been happening is that we've seen more and more professional jobs are also moving to this 1099 status. Mm -hmm. So you ended yeah. up with like dentists and photographers and writers also being like, well, wait a second here. I'm an independent contractor and I'm incorporated and like this, you know, the companies are saying they're not going to give me any money anymore. And then of course you also have Uber and Lyft and all these gig economy companies saying like, well, there won't be any flexibility for the workers, which is flexibility. complete BS, right? Yeah. Like I have flexibility. I'm talking to you at four o'clock in the afternoon, lots <laughs> of jobs. My right. husband works in corporate America. He can leave work and go go to the dentist like lots of jobs yeah, of flexibility when you hear the it's word like, flexibility from a big corporation hold on to your wallet because they're going to take something yeah. <laughs> yeah it's flexibility for them it's yeah. not flexibility for you because yeah. the work is not necessarily there if you want to do let's say uber deliveries during the so-called mother's hours of like nine to two thirty good luck because there's not necessarily going to be a lot of demand for deliveries during that time those right. deliveries are going to be during the dinner hours, which is probably when you want to spend time with your kids. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like we, there have been other efforts to uh, sort of give some of these workplace protections to gig workers. Um, in New York, for instance, there's now a minimum wage for gig work, for Uber drivers um, that's supposed to take that into account. But it's still, you know, it's, we've let the companies control the narrative. Yeah. And, all too often, we're willing to believe it because it's technology and hard right. to understand. It's, it, it, yeah, it's it, it's technology. They ref, they refuse to be transparent about how the technology works. Um, there is just kind of, especially in places like California, a, a, you know, a cult of reverence around both the technology and the idea that you know anybody can pull up their. You know, you know, do something like this and and create something amazing of themselves even though statistically that's something that that happens uh, about as often as as winning the lottery and and it just it just it just seems like there's a, a very unvirtuous cycle about the way in which these companies extract wealth from people who are already under enormous pressure and it and I, tell you the last time I, I i tried to you know take one of these you know ride services things i i was way overcharged i try to av avoid it at, at all costs um but they extract the wealth they influence the policy they pay off the 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 people who are in charge of making the the policy um they basically do their will which allows them to like extract more wealth and continue the process and and, and lock that in so it, it's kind of depressing at at this point and I, I, I don't know what can be done except like just further organization, further efforts at, 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 at job protection in terms of, of unions and, and whatever localities, municipalities and, and state level efforts there, there can. But if it can't be done in California, the, the news does not seem good. Is there any hope on the horizon anywhere? Yes. So there is some hope on the horizon, right? Mm -hmm. So one other thing that we could do, um, you know, move over to W-2. But then the other option would be to expand unemployment assistance to include gig workers in the future and to change, overhaul our unemployment system so that people don't lose their job and think, oh, I have no other options. Let me go do Uber. Let me go do DoorDash. And then they end up getting stuck in with this gig work. Yeah. You know, it's... Um, 
if we expand the unemployment assistance. So we did things like the CARES Act, but it was permanent where if you lost your job, you could get this much money for longer than, you know, some states are down to just a couple of weeks of unemployment assistance. Yeah. If we expanded it, then that would give people more time to get back on their feet, to think about careers, start businesses, and not have to join the gig economy out of desperation. Unemployment light, if you will. <laughs> yeah, that, that that is basically what it amounts to. And uh, it's 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 light in the sense that it's it's not going to make you healthier if you try it. It's just going to lighten your wallet. Is is what it's going right. to what, what it's, it's going to do. It's the type of light where they you know replace the fat with all the chemicals. <laughs> yes, no, that's a, it's a very good point. You know, there there actually is a a, a pretty strong analog there. Uh, Alexandria Ravenel, uh, she's an assistant professor of sociology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and she is the author of Side Hustle Safety Net: How Vulnerable Workers Survive Precarious Times. Alexandria, thank you so much. I really appreciate your work on this, and thank you for being with us today on Facebook America. Thanks for having me. Up next, more about side hustles. I'm Beowulf Rockland. This is Facepalm America. Facepalm America. I'm Beowulf Rockland, facepalmamerica.com. And we just spoke with Alexandria J. Ravenel, the author of Side Hustle Safety Net, How Vulnerable Workers Survive Precarious Times. This just came by my eye in the news today. Side hustles have long been on the rise. And uh, this, by the way, is from the Make It section of CNBC. You can make it if you really try, if you pull yourself up by your bootstraps. More than half of Gen Xers, that's me, 53% have a side hustle, as well as half of millennials and 40% of Gen Xers. Somebody who, whoever was writing this didn't pay attention. More than half of Gen Xers and more than 40% of Gen Xers. One of these generations is not like the other. Uh, I'm assuming that boomers are in there somewhere, maybe. I know boomers who have side hustles. God, I hate that term. With such a wide swath of Americans adding part-time gigs to their regular income, or, as we mentioned, just surviving on that, which sucks, quote, I think it goes to show that people need the extra money, said Ted Rossman, senior industry analyst at Bankrate. Many of them are not just taking on passion projects for fun. You think? You really think so? And when it comes to the future, 44% of side hustlers also believe they'll always need one. That is a side hustle. Why are American adults feeling out of luck about their financial futures? Here's what Rossman believes is driving their pessimism. A lot of workers are underpaid. Yes! <laughs> Duh! Have you have you tried to get a job recently? Yeah. Pay sucks. Employers, by and large, are trying to screw you. Another one, inflation is this really big elephant in the room. Oh, yeah, that's right. Your, your money is worth nothing, and you're getting less of it to boot. Also, a weakening job market could mean more people get a side gig. Yeah. And also, because, yeah, everybody's being thrown into this massive, desperate competition against one another because fewer people are able to get regular W-2 jobs. It really sucks. So, <laughs> with, with that shining positive news, I urge you, Organize. Join a group of people who are working to change things for the better. That could be a union. I heard Ralph Nader talk about this a a few weeks ago. A club. Engage in your community. Join together with other people. Because that's the only way we're going to overcome this. I want to thank 
Ace Elson and Rosabelle Hine, the producers of this program. And until next week... Enjoy the day. <laughs>